Thank you for joining Wars of the Roses. As we continue with part 41, Cornelius Agrippa, book seven, some Christian students of the Kabbalah from the Doctrine and Literature of the Kabbalah by Arthur Edward Waite. Four, Cornelius Agrippa. The untimely death of Picus de Mirandola took place in the early childhood of another Christian Kabbalist, Cornelius Agrippa of Nettesheim, born at Cologne in 1486. It is to him that we owe the first methodical description of the whole Kabbalistic system considered under the three heads of natural philosophy, mathematical philosophy, and theology. Agrippa is therefore of very great importance to our inquiry, and his three books entitled De Occulta Philosophia are the starting point of Kabbalistic knowledge among the Latin reading scholars of Europe. It is needless to say that his treatise enjoyed immense repute and authority. We must remember, however, that it is professedly a magical work by which I do not mean that it is a ritual for the evocation of spirits, but it unfolds the philosophical principles upon which all forms of magic were supposed to proceed. And this is so true that the forged fourth book, which was added to it soon after the death of Agrippa, and does provide a species of magical ritual, is so much in consonance with the genuine work that it might well have been by the same hand. We must therefore expect that the magical side of Kabbalism, that which deals with the properties and the virtues of divine names and so forth, is much more fully developed than the cosmology of the Sefer Yetzirah or the divine mysteries of the Zohar. We have also to remember that although Agrippa was the first writer who elucidated the Kabbalistic system, he was far much learned in the occult philosophy of Greece and Rome than in that of the later Hebrews. He was sufficiently acquainted with Hebrew to be able to understand and expound the mysteries of the divine names and the notankon connected therewith. Of the literature itself, he gives no information from which we could infer his knowledge. He does not mention the Sefer Yetzirah or the Zohar, both of which were then only accessible in manuscript. And I am inclined to think that his acquaintance with Kabbalistic subjects was formed chiefly through the Conclusiones Kabbalisticae of Mirandola, which, as we have seen, appeared at Rome in the year of Agrippa's birth. It should be added also that there are serious errors in his division of the Hebrew alphabet, which would not have been made by one who was acquainted with any authoritative source of knowledge, as, for example, the Book of Formation and Mistakes Without Number in his lettering of the divine names. But the latter point cannot be justly pressed, as the faults may have rested with the printer. It is noticeable in this connection that the doctrine of the occult virtues residing in words and names is expounded from the authority of the Platonists. It is only in the scales of the 12 numbers, dealt with somewhat minutely in the second book, that the Kabbalistic system is developed, but this has remained the chief source of information among occult students up to this day. The most important information is, however, in the third book, devoted to theology and the doctrines, mainly Kabbalistic concerning angels, demons, and the souls of men, but creating correspondences with classical mythology wherever possible. Thus, Ein Sof is identified with the Knight of Orpheus and the Kabbalistic Samael with Typhon. The ten Sephiroth are described as the vestments, instruments, or exemplars of the archetype, having an influence on all created things through high to low, following a defined order. It would serve no purpose to repeat all the points of the instruction, because much of it has been already given. While the tables of commutations showing the extraction of angelical names would require elaborate diagrams. My object is to note rather than illustrate exhaustively the character of Agrippa's exposition, which is concerned largely with the so-called practical Kabbalah and very slightly with the more important philosophical literature. It brought him no satisfaction and before his troubled life drew to its disastrous close, he recorded his opinion that the Kabbalistic art, which he had diligently and laboriously sought after, was merely a rhapsody of superstition, that its mysteries were wrested from the Holy Scriptures, a play with allegory proving nothing. As to the alleged miracles wrought by its practical operations, he supposes that there is no one so foolish as to believe it has any such powers, in a word, the Kabbalah of the Jews is nothing but a pernicious superstition by which, at their pleasure, they gather, divide, and transfer words, names, and letters in Scripture, and by making one thing out of another, dissolve the connections of the truth. What was done by the Jews for the literature of the ancient covenant was performed, he goes on to say, 
For the Greek documents of Christianity by the Ophites, Gnostics, and Valentinians who produced a Greek Kabbalah, as Rabanus the monk later on attempted with the Latin characters. I do not know that a modern writer could have put the position more clearly. I do not think that anyone at the present day can regard transpositions and extractions seriously. But the question is whether these things were not after all a subterfuge, or if not exactly a subterfuge, a corruption of an older system. Agrippa adds another argument which also from its own standpoint could not be better expressed. If Kabbalistic art proceed from God as the Jews boast, and if it conduce to the perfection of life, the health of men and the worship of God, as also to the truth of understanding, surely that spirit of truth which has left their synagogue and has come to teach us all truth, would not have concealed it from his church even until these last times, and this the more seeing that the church knows all things which are of God, while his mysteries of salvation are revealed in every tongue, for every tongue has the same power, if there be the same equal piety. Neither is there any name in heaven or on earth by which we can be saved, whereby we can work miracles, but the one name, Jesus, wherein all things are recapitulated and contained. Of course, in the last analysis, this argument proves too much. There is either a peculiar virtue in divine names, or there is not. If there be, the Christian cannot well deny it to Jehovah. And if there be not, the doctrine of the great name in Christianity is a subtlety no less idle than the Tetragrammaton or the Schemahamphorash. We know, however, that insofar as names represent ideas, they are moving powers of the intellectual world. When they are used without inspiration and without knowledge, they are dead and inert, like other empty vehicles. The Kabbalistic Jews believed that they could dissect the name without losing the vital essence which informs it, and they erred therein. The name of Jesus spells grace and salvation to millions, but it spells nothing when lettered separately and nothing when it is transposed. To say otherwise is to rave. Thank you for watching and please don't forget to share, like, subscribe and comment, and if you can, please consider donating to Wars of the Roses. Links to PayPal and Patreon are in the description. Thank you so very much.